have right in front of you. Just want to remind everybody that we are focused on the sections in front of us, which is uh, those that are left to be reviewed. Our focus here is, and in, in, in everyone, please uh, just bear with me here. I think we had a kind of a focus here on the recommendations of if you have a, a dissenting opinion or something to add in here, I only ask that you have in mind what you want to add in here or what you would change. Uh, and keep in mind that these are recommendations only here. Uh, so with that, uh, let's pick up with recommendation one. And this one focused on Kalia. Uh, you will notice in here, and I'm going to note for you anywhere where I've made any uh, changes. In fact, I've tried to note them in green. I've only added in here what Kalia is. Um, and I only did that because I think we noted that anywhere we had uh, abbreviations, we wanted to be specific. Um, other than that, there was no change in this section on my part. Uh, any any part here that anyone would want to um, revise or change before we move uh, forward? Please feel free to unmute. And if you talk over each other, I can just uh, ask us to uh, take turns. Any comments on recommendation one? Okay. Thank you. We're going to skip recommendation two because we uh, all confirmed this on our uh, it's October 29th meeting. Um, and um, we noted that during our last meeting. Recommendation three, what's different here than the one in front of you? It's just that I've noted here what POST stands for. POST Commission is the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission. That's what POST stands for. Here, this recommendation says that uh, is requesting an annual training should include additional training for supervisory personnel. Um, there was also a note here by our vice uh, chair that this should be a bit more uh, detail and or be a separate recommendation. Any additional comments or anything else we would want to add in here or, or is this recommendation sufficient on its own? Madam Chair, the, the only only thing I would add, this is uh, Russ Fully, is that um, sure. Post is a it's it's a state created agency. So I wonder how if you're if the recommendation is addressing what Post should do, uh, it's kind of outside of our scope of authority. So uh, I'm just curious as to how this recommendation works to the police department. Very good point, Mr. Uh, Pulley. Thank you. Uh, so perhaps to Mr. Pulley's point here, we're asking if we're we're asking the MMPD to supplement because uh, we certainly can't. We don't hold any authority to ask the state to or to rec recommend the state to do anything. Um, Mr. Pulley, would that be your recommendation, or um, or do you have ideas, or does anyone have uh, thoughts on that, or should we take this out? Anyone on if, this? If, if the recommendation is to the police department to supplement, then that would be a, a, an appropriate way to go about it. I, I, you know, it's kind of tough because it's outside of our scope of authority to recommend. That's the only point I would make is we can't tell Post what to do. Mm -hmm. So maybe well, this supplement. Well, <clears throat> go ahead. This is Tori Johnson. Let me because I this is our accreditation committee i'm not exactly sure where the post proposal came from um the idea was to increase uh generally have sort of a track a training track for supervisory personnel uh and it was really my recollection and uh lanell is on this as well uh is that it was really directed uh just at the at at the uh, police department as I said, I don't know where post came in, but it was just talking about the training academy and their curriculum uh, should in, it try to be more, um, uh, to have more annual trainings for supervisors that are directed to supervision rather than other things that would apply to all officers in the department. Okay, Mr. John. So, what should is your recommendation, Mr. Matthews? Feel free to uh, chime in here. Will we be uh, eliminating, deleting this, and then simply adding to recommendation four to, to add on this training here? I'm happy to follow your your guidance here. Well, I, I, 
my situation would be to just eliminate the whole reference to the to post and just say that the that the uh, training academy or the police department or whatever uh, consider adding additional trainings specifically for supervisory personnel on an annual basis or something like that. Would you mind saying that one more time? Uh, if, I, if I'd written it down, uh, adding additional training for supervisory personnel on an annual basis. I think it was our understanding that 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 that. That, that that was not done necessarily on an annual basis. They got they got some additional training, some of it away from, uh, you know, outside of, of the training academy and so forth, but we just thought there was more that perhaps could be done there um, uh, in that regard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and just eliminate the reference to post, which I, I don't think is, I agree with Mr. Pulley, that's not what we're trying to do. Okay. And this Mr. is Chris. Matthew. Yeah, go right ahead. This is Chris Jackson. I was, I think it might be helpful to those who read it uh, to understand that the purpose for it would be, or the need, or the hope for the additional training would create or provide. Okay. In, in, got you there. Okay. So we would add a, an additional clause here to say, in order to um and, and i believe mr johnson was getting to that there um and dr paxton i believe you were on discipline here too or or am i wrong my memory not serving me correctly on that no i was on policy you were on i was on the policy you on the um on the accreditation subcommittee no uh captain oliver was with that Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But, but Dr. J, but um, you, I, maybe I got the voices uh, mixed up here. Someone was saying that they were the good point of, let's put in here the intended impact of add this added training here. And I'd love to get some help here on what language we want to add in there. Well, I, you know, and again, I think, I think the idea was that uh, we've got was was really to go along with the fact that we we have a lot of policies that are that are in the uh, manual and so forth, and the idea was to see that uh, it's important that the policies are implemented and and correct and the uh, employees are correctly supervised. I don't know that we had a specific target other than we felt that it it right. seemed and. In talking to the to the uh, training academy, that they felt they did that they could use more. They 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 felt they could do more in that regard. They just weren't presently able to do that. But I don't have a okay. specific language. I mean, I understand the 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 point there, but I I don't have any specific language about that. No problem. That's okay. No problem. We can come back to it if need be. Um, but not, not a problem here in this regard here. Let, let's, uh, is there anything else, anything, anyone else wants to raise as it relates to recommendation three? Anyone else? Okay. Not recommendation four speaks to the training academy um, in the uh, replacing the existing uh, training academy um, and noting that it is uh, both outdated and too small uh, as it relates to, we're speaking now to infrastructure. Any, any thoughts or uh, comments here as it relates to recommendation four? Okay. Recommendation five speaks to eight can't wait. Um, eight can't, in, in recommendation five, by the way, it's, it's kind of a two-part only, and I don't mean two-part, but it's kind of split up into two um, small uh, paragraphs here. It speaks first in a bit of an intro um, space about eight can't wait launching 
uh, and then uh, the website being last updated in October of 2020 here in, in MMPD's policies. And then the recommendation itself is that MMPD should incorporate the policies to fulfill the remaining four recommendations of the A Can't Wait initiative. And then it specifically speaks to the requirement, um, the four procedures of uh, being updated of requiring de-escalation, duty, duty to intervene, ban shooting at moving vehicles, and requiring comprehensive reporting. Those are the four that currently are not included. Any comments here in, um, as it relates to these four being included in our MMPD and, and asking MMPD now to include those four in our uh, Nashville? Includes uh, policies. I'm going to delete this question mark here. Uh, Vice Chair um, Lucas, I know you have this question mark in red here in the duty to intervene. Did you have a question or a comment you wanted to raise as it relates to duty to intervene? Yeah. <clears throat> For those who were on that um, committee, what is the eight can't wait? And I apologize because I had actually highlighted that for me to look it up <laughs> and I overlooked that. But what is the um, duty to, is that the duty to, for colleagues to intervene with colleagues? Because I believe that already exists as part of MNPD um, policy. Well, I think there's some, I think there's some debate about not only that, but some of the other things as as already being incorporated in in the current police department policies. I think we discussed this once before. I don't know that it's been definitively determined, but I think we can just simply, uh, I mean, I'm happy with leaving it to the police department to 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 just simply. Uh, review its policies to determine that it that it uh, uh, respond to the to the to the various points of eight can't wait, and you know they may agree with some of. I mean, I, you know, for instance, shooting in mo moving vehicles, they have a they have a slightly different take than than eight can't wait. I mean, that may be something that that may never get resolved one way or the other. It's still a it's still a, a you know. It shouldn't be done, but I think they've got a limited situation when it's in self-defense of the officer or something like, or another person. In any event, I mean, I'm happy to uh, uh, just simply ask that the police department look at it uh, with that in mind that we want to adopt as much of, of eight can't wait as possible. Uh, but so that's what I'll say. Yeah, just to add on to that, uh, in acknowledging that MMPD did review they can't wait over the summer, uh, they put out a, uh, a document that showed the, um, the changes that they have currently agreed to or committed to as a department. Uh, Mr. Oliver, when, when we were discussing this, Mr. Oliver pointed out that the policy manual itself definitely doesn't reflect some of the same language that's in the document they put out over the summer. Uh, and so making sure that that language matches policy manual is what, what they intend to do. Um, excuse me for my tardiness, um, everybody, but um, I wanted to give an update. I did meet with the Assistant Chief, Deputy Chief uh, Hager, um, shortly after we originally met and I, um, published all my findings and I came to discover that in further uh, looking into their policies um, of the eight came wait they meet seven of the eight um, and they provided me with documents to show that they met that and then the one that they did not and it was for good reason and I agree with the um, shooting at moving vehicles on that eight the banding of shooting that moving vehicles um, and the reason why it's not totally banned, in, and this is, um, if you go to PERC, which is um, a national um, research organization overseeing policing, is that because in terrorist incidents and stuff, they have been proven that if you can stop the vehicle from advancing on large crowds um, that might try to attack people in that way, 
uh, you wouldn't want to have such a restrictive uh, policy um, depending on the circumstance and situation. Like I said, this is more so for terrorism. So um, research did back that one. So of the eight can't wait, um, seven, they are in um, line with that and they do have it in their policies. And like I said, the banning from shooting moving vehicles, which I also agree with them, um, uh, given PERP, um, is that that's for terrorism. And so it's very, very, very um, rare, but that could be a reason they could. Thank you. you know, it's, it's my understanding in the A camp A that that terrorism exception is in that one as well. Yes. I mean, it's, that maybe I misunderstood. It's not an exception to Metro necessarily. It's also listed in A camp Way as an exception also meaning stopping a terrorist in a moving vehicle that's going to, you know, has a bomb and driving to a building or something like that. Yes, that's 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 correct. Um, it reflects that they can't wait, but their website is a little behind and updated. So if you go and check it out, it wouldn't match. Um, but you're right. Um, they do have documents elsewhere that you can find where that exception is also in they can't wait. You know, I also just wanted to add that I think we have consistently found that the pol that the policy manual is not rec is not reflecting what their um, policies actually are, meaning that are either verbal or in their training newsletter or whatever. And maybe just at the very beginning of our document, we should just say there all of our recommendations should be reflective reflected in the manual and then that kind of makes sure that all of our recommendations in turn go into the manual because i think that is maybe a problem consistency across consistent across the board I, I know because of time constraints we can't go through each one of these and make sure that they're in or not in the manual but i think most of them are not in the manual of, of my thought. It might be easier just to put a blanket thing in the beginning that we want all of this reflected in the manual. Because if it isn't reflected in the manual, when problems arise, then it's easy to say, well, it's not in the manual. You know, it, it needs to be. Yeah. I think that's a great point, Ms. Fallon. We've already agreed uh, on another blanket uh, kind of overarching statement as it relates to, um, you know, I think it, I can't remember the statement, but we said um, to make sure that we weren't running against any state laws, if we weren't putting out something that, um, that yeah. reflected conflict of law. So um, we can add something like that to just say that, I mean, that ties back to what the mayor was saying as well, that we, we want everything, he wants to make sure that things remain consistent. Um, as well, uh, and I I think your point to all of these recommendations we will put in the manual. So, rather than us have to sit here and pick and choose if they're exactly in there or not, it might be easier just to say up front they should all be in there. Mm -hmm. You want to take your point? Any other comments or recommendations as it relates to recommendation five? And Ms. Davis, before we go to the next discipline, we just for a clarification on recommendation uh, four, that the existing training academy refers to the facilities rather than the curriculum. Is that correct? Yep, yeah, and we can type uh, type that right in. Yes, Dr. Jackson, it's absolutely correct. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Moving to discipline, recommendation one should be on your screen here. Um, we're uh, first speaking about the 45 day time limit um, from the time an employee requests a hearing uh, until it is conducted. Uh, it goes on from there, talks a bit about the mirror. It should mirror the time uh, given uh, to MMPD to conduct the OPA investigation. Um, just want to open, is there any conversation here as to um, changing any of their language or adding to this language, a thorough language in front of you uh, as it relates to recommendation one? I know it's a little, I want to give everyone a moment. I'll 
we um, we can probably get some more seconds here. Recommendation. Recommendation two speaks to form 108. In the underlined green section is uh, something I've added since Thursday uh, over the weekend. I just added in there um, a, a descriptor from form 108. This comes directly from MMPD's description in the um, from their manual of what 108 is. It's their key document used for collecting uh, uh, data related to reporting of use of force occurrences. Um, and then with, for this recommendation, it says that Form 108 should be mandatory despite injury or soft empty hand contact between officer and any non MPB person. Are we in agreement on recommendation two? Madam Chair, I've got one uh, uh, little bit of a concern about the wording in recommendation two. Uh, sure. Mr. Russ Pulley, um, the issue around soft, empty hand contact, um, I believe the definition of soft, ha empty hand contact is anytime somebody puts her, anytime a police officer puts her hands on somebody just to uh, uh, introduce handcuffs or anything. Uh, so I'd be a little bit concerned about uh, having to fill out a 108 anytime somebody puts their hands on a, a subject when there's no injury involved. Uh, that seems like a little bit uh, a little bit much in terms of paperwork for police officers to do a 108 every time they arrest someone. So uh, that's that's the one concern I would have about the language in that recommendation. Mr. Pulley, any other thoughts on this here? I do. Yeah, Mr. Lucas? Yeah, I had, along with Councilman Pulley, I had some concerns about the way that it was written. It seemed somewhat um, confusing. Um, thank you for adding the language about what a 108 is. Um, but I don't think it makes it clear. I'm, I'm not sure if the word despite is what is throwing me off. Um, if that's supposed to mean regardless of injury. Um, but my understanding is a form 108 is used whenever there is a use of force, whether or not that's um, soft empty hand contact could mean use of force. Like if you're, um, just sort of twisting somebody's arm behind their back it could be, you know, I, I agree with Councilman Pulley that just any time you touch a suspect is not really a um, use of a 108. But I, I just wasn't sure what that language meant, despite injury or soft, empty hand contact, because that sounds like that's the time when you would have to do a 108, as if there is an injury or um, soft, empty hand contact. So I just think we need to be really clear about what we're talking about here is that it doesn't just have to be when someone is shot or someone is, um, you know, it's whenever there's use of force. So we just need to go back to whatever that continuum is and say that, you know, starting here, you need to do a 108. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep, no, so how would you reword it? Yeah, so how would you reword it? Yeah. Yeah. I, say that MNPD's key document used for the collection of data related to reporting of use of force occurrences is the form 108. This form should be mandatory in the event of injury or soft empty hand. Um, let me think what the right word is. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind also suggesting that we just define soft, empty hand contact. Yeah. Why don't we just define it instead of all of us wondering what it is? And there must be um, a body of information that we can pull that official definition from. I mean, maybe for now, Ms. Davis, we just put in parentheses, define empty hand contact and pull it from resources we already have. I don't know the definition off the top of my head, but there's probably a legal definition of soft, empty hand contact, and then we don't have to have people guess what that means. 
because I mean, my concern is we know that it's used for any kind of those jujitsu moves that they talked about that can actually cause very serious injury. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, go right ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, that's it. Okay. Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> yeah. There's a, I believe, page 715. Here's a way, uh, this doesn't speak to the definition of soft empty hand control, but uh, it current, the manual currently reads that personnel should report all use of force incidents. However, no MNPD form 108 is required when official presence, verbal direction, and or soft empty hand control is used by the employee and there is no injury or allegation of injury. Um, so <clears throat> the soft empty hand control was defined for me by police administration as literally touching the person in any way, placing handcuffs on the person, escorting a prisoner by holding their arm, putting a hand uh, on their head to prevent them from hitting it while getting into the back of a police car. So I don't know that that definition is in any kind of official document though. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the definition. Uh, well, in, one that case, in that case, I think we should seek a definition of it because I also know that it can include strangulation and pressure points and, and those can kill somebody. You can kill somebody with their hands. Mm -hmm. So strangulation, meaning pressure point to the carotids, would, it can cause anoxic brain injury. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not comfortable with not defining that. I mean, I agree with um, Mr. Pooley. Sure, soft hand can include those things, but I know from my work, from going to the training academy, they defined it in the training academy much, much more broadly than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it does include strangulation. Yeah, I mean, you I mean, need to definitely, I, I would certainly think that that would fall within what they're doing, uh, what they have now, but I, I agree that uh, a clarification on what that means so that you could differentiate between those incidents where it's appropriate to uh, uh, have a 108 and and not having a 108 on those issues where you're merely touching a person to apply a handcuff or something or yeah. escorting a person by holding their arm. Yeah, and Mr. Mr. Pulley and Ms. Bala, I think you're both, you're in Vice Chair Lucas, I think you're all coming together here on, on an important part here, maybe the uh, what's missing here is that it's not defined in the manual um, and that we need to recommend that MNPD concretely define what is soft empty hand contact uh, so that once it's clearly and concretely defined, we know exactly what falls within that, that space. And it, could it, we agree? Yes, and it absolutely needs to be defined because when you use pressure points on carotids, it is an anoxic, it can cause an anoxic brain injury. And 50 to 75% of the time, there is no physical injury to an anoxic brain injury. There is no bruising. You have to truly, um, you know, be dead to determine if there's an anoxic brain injury because you have to do an autopsy of the brain because that's where the injury is. And so it's affected in memory and, and all of those kind of things that are not assessed as injury, even by the victim themselves or, uh, you know, much of the time. And I feel like there is not a clear understanding of strangulation in the police force. And, um, you know, and especially because as we know, when we were there, you know, I asked the question in the training session, is there anything that you would like to bring back that is currently not allowed? And that was one of the things that was said that they would like to bring back because it immediately brings um, an individual to their knees <laughs> because it is an anoxic brain injury, to be honest. And I'm, I, I'm pretty strong on this one. We need a definition. We do because 
I think soft tissue, I think this soft hand is usually referenced the way that Congressman Pulley is referencing it, but in reality, I can promise you that the pressure points to the carotids is used a lot. And because you can't see the injury, it is it is a serious injury that is often hidden. Gotcha. You are hearing this below. Okay. Um, is there anyone feel differently about here? Just this 1.5, and by the way, they won't be numbered, so these numbers will disappear. Um, but just for our purposes, I think we should state out first the, the recommendation that we define soft empty hand contact and then include the um, recommendation too. Are we in agreement there? That, or does anyone rather uh, feel differently? You don't have to state that you agree. Just let me know if you feel different. My, my only addition to that would be um, um, if soft hemp, empty hand contact includes this wide gamut of things that mm -hmm. are uh, the example that Ms. Bilal uh, just articulated and just simply touching a suspect, uh, then yeah, a clear definition and a separation of, uh, of what rises to the level of an offense that, not, a, not an offense, but a, a, a tactic or a technique uh, that would warrant a 108 and one which doesn't. So I think that's, uh, we gotta come up with a wording that, where we can separate all of those. If that okay. makes any sense, what I said. Yeah, uh, I think we can add that. And what warrants the filing of a Form 108? Um, yeah, can we add that right? That's that's clause here, uh, Councilman Pullen. What do you think? State that again, uh, Madam Chair. I was just I just added that added that little clause here, and what warrants the filing of a Form 108? So as they're teaching what you know, is uh, qualifies as soft, empty hand contact. I think that ne that needs to be added in. I think you raise a great point um, of what warrants the filing of a Form 108. They should be taught together. Yes, okay. yeah, that works. Um, well, and specifically, I think, you know, soft, empty, empty hand to the neck or head is, you know, really the key areas that cause anoxic brain injury. I think we'll be able to differentiate between like what Councilman Pulley said, which is, you know, the officer placing their hand on the suspect's head to prevent them from hitting it on the car uh, versus some sort of um, use of force to get a subject under control. Um, I, I think we'll be able to find a definition that makes that clear. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. I agree. Um, thank you. With that, um, Jennifer, I think we've been able to, we've taken care of 1.5, 2 as well. Um, can move uh, to 3 here, unless I hear any objections. Um, recommendation 3 here speaks to the clear definition of broad terms like, <clears throat> excuse me, broad serious bodily injury and injury. So the recommendation is asking that MNPD develop a clear definition for broad terms like serious bodily injury and injury for determining disciplinary actions. And it also states that any hospitalization of an individual should automatically warrant removal from the line of duty and field assignments until formal investigation has been completed. And I believe we say until a formal. Um, any thoughts, uh, comments here on this recommendation, recommendation three? Yes, I have yeah. uh, one comment about the last line with respect to hospitalization. <clears throat> I think that needs to be clarified a little bit because uh, uh, having personally experienced this, both investigating civil rights matters on, uh, for the Bureau and uh, being a part of some of these things when I was in uniform, uh, there are uh, occasions where uh, suspects uh, or people who you have in custody will inflict injuries on themselves and uh, and things of this nature. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I would hate to have to have a police officer removed from duty pending an investigation on something like that. So 
um, maybe a little more clarity rather than an automatic uh, uh, removal from duty when someone's hospitalized. Thank you, Councilman Pulley. Any comments or reactions to that? Any, way, any thoughts on how we could maybe broaden or maybe make the language a bit more specific? Or is there comfort here in the current language? Maybe a little, uh, Maybe. Uh, a little clause that any hospitalization that occurs as a result of uh, uh, any action by the police officer should automatically warrant removal. Something like that would work for me. <clears throat> well, this Tory Johnson, I, I agree with Councilman Pulley on 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 that, but I also think we need to define hospitalization. Does that mean taking them to general hospital just to have them checked out? Or does it mean they're actually in there for some extended period of time, any period of time? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think that uh, because I think there could be instances that you'd have somebody uh, uh, basically at a desk over something that, that doesn't amount to anything. As, and, but, but on the other hand, I think it's a, a fine policy otherwise. Yep. No, I take your point, Mr. Yeah, I'm sorry, go right ahead. I got someone else. I thought I did. Yeah, that I, I got a little a bit more bass in my voice than usual. I thought I saw like somebody else for a second. Uh, but I take Mr. Johnson's point and um, think similarly, it would be great if we could add something in here about perhaps if it's um, any, if it, it, maybe it's extended hospitalization. Um, I, Mr. Johnson, what do you think? Maybe if, is it, you know, more than one day? Is it, would that, is it sound, you know, respectable or is it well, two it, days? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't, that's, that I think is a, the difficulty we have trying to write this like, like we are. Um, no, I just, uh, I, I just think there is some line between it's serious enough that that something action ought to be taken, and when it's when it's more of a a, a, a precaution or 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 something like that. I, I don't know what the I, I'm not here to tell you. I know what the definition should be. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not saying I do either. I, but I but I had similar thoughts is what I'm saying uh, too. I just not exactly sure, sure what that how that would be interpreted would that would that mean just simply taking somebody to general hospital at their request uh which is which is i think part of the 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 policy can be uh or or and it and it's really relatively minor or, or doesn't exist at all or something that's considerably more uh more serious well what if it was involuntary hospitalization I think what uh, Tori's trying to get at here is that uh, uh, the police can, you know, they'll, if, if it's a scratch, you can find yourself at uh, the hospital checking out a uh, uh, subject because the sheriff's department's not going to accept the prisoner in many cases unless they've been medically cleared if something like this happens. So if you take them to the hospital, have checked out, and then they let them go, then you know, does this really rise to the level of a kind of hospitalization that warrants what we're talking about here? And, um, and I agree, it's, it's going to be tough to come up with language to really draft that. You know, and they also, uh, they have taken intoxicated people to the hospital for whatever reason, you know, blood tests and things of this nature. So, um, Anyway, I don't know what I don't know how to word it either. Yeah, I I do agree though. It's too important to just leave as is without a um, um, a solution here. Um, no, just I think saying, a suggestion. Would we yeah, want to so say please. serious bodily injury? Any hospitalization of an injury that occurs with and results in serious bodily injury? I mean, that's clear. Maybe we want it broader than that, but. And if you just said serious bodily injury at the hand, well, we've, we've already put that at the hand of the police officer in here, so. Well, I think we need to tie it to use of force. I think that's what the point of the recommendation is, is should an officer use excessive force on someone in 
or appropriate level of force on someone and it results in a hospitalization, that they should be removed from duty and this, this situation, a formal investigation should be completed. So you know, I, think it's, I think tying it all back to u use of force is what's yes. important here. Uh, it may be an appropriate level. I mean, a formal investigation may show, no, that was an appropriate level of force. But whenever it's a use of force, which ties it back to the Form 108, um, um, should yeah, I think we're I think we're already there. I think what we're trying to figure out is what the definition definition of hospitalization is. Right. Uh, so we don't again we don't want to you know somebody. I think hospitalization is admission. I mean, just from my understanding from psychiatric hospitalization is that being seen in an ER is not hospitalization. Hospitalization is when a patient's admitted to the that hospital. That works for me. That works for me. So any admission to the hospital, if that makes it clear. Hospital admission that results from use of force yeah. that, is direct, that is connected to use of force. Correct. Because I think I like that language in there, um, Ms. Lucas, only because I think often when you're dealing with intoxicated individuals, they often do get hurt because they fall badly, you know, potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me ask you all, based on all the things that we're, we're sharing here, um, Professor Lucas, and what you shared too, what's missing from this highlighted uh, sentence? I'm trying to make sure I'm collecting everyone's um, input here. Is there anything I would, I would say in, in the event that a use of force results in an admission to the hospital. Wait, 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 but what you're saying, like, where would you put it and what would you be taking out? Just so I can make sure I'm including the, the it. High, I, I am rewording that highlighted. Oh, okay. Then let me just go down here and, okay, go okay. ahead. Okay. In the event that a use of force mm -hmm. results in the admission to the hospital in it in to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The officer should be removed from the line of duty and then the rest of that sentence. So and field assignments dot 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 can go at the end. How does that feel to the committee? So we would be uh, uh, substituting the sentence, the second sentence of uh, recommendation Correct. three Correct. for the highlighted sentence uh, in front of you. I, this is Tori Johnson again. I, I, I'm in favor of that. The only thing that concerns me is just the length of time that, I mean, if, if um, I mean, it's really a, something that would address, be addressed to the police department, but I just don't know. Um, I mean, some of these things I would think could be pretty quickly maybe determined that, that, it was not a problem, or, you know, it was an appropriate use of force. Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, I mean, generally, I think this is a, a, an improvement over what we had. And I guess I'm, I'm okay with it. I just do think it could result in, in, in someone being uh, off for a period of time longer than necessary. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or? Is there a general consensus here? My only thought as it relates to that is he is absolutely right. One of the things that we don't want to do is unnecessarily remove officers from the street for uh, undue periods of time when we're already short staffed as it is. Um, however, I, the only thing that makes, that gives me comfort in doing it the way we're doing it is we're, basically putting it to the lap of the police department 
and they are well aware of those uh, constraints. And uh, this tells them what our concern is, and I think they could probably come up with uh, their own uh, policy, taking into consideration all of those things that uh, Mr. Johnson just articulated. So that's Careful. kind of where I land. Okay. Thank you. I think, Any other thoughts here? Or, yeah, I yeah, think it's ahead. very important to understand, though, that it is reasonable to say uh, if a suspect is hospitalized, meaning that is admitted to the hospital with injuries directly related to a use of force, that that is a very serious occurrence and needs to be investigated. My understanding is that this was just, again, one of those like putting it into policy, what is probably already happening in practice, is that that's very serious. If someone has to be hospitalized directly related to the use of force, uh, that needs to be looked into, and you know, well, it's currently it, it's currently being looked into. Those things don't right. escape them without investigations. So. Exactly. So I, I really feel like this is one that's just sort of codifying what's already in practice. So I'm not really sure that um, it's not already being done. Therefore, I don't know why there would be any objection to including it as the official policy. Sounds like we're in the same similar neighborhood in this space, and and I think um, both Vice Chair Lucas's your comment there, and also Councilman Pulley's um, space that MPD would work expeditiously for this uh, formal investigation to take place, um, and also we, uh, of course, in NCO and in, in their uh, activation here too, um, in the space as well. Um, if, if we, it sounds like we have a general consensus to, here too, uh, in comfort with the alternative language here, the substitution of the language. So I'm revising the language here because it seems like we're comfortable here. Uh, I'm going to move to recommendation four, but we can certainly come back to three without a problem if folks still have thoughts here. Um, there is a section here, and we can. I'm, I'm actually my recommendation here for. Um, uh, four is to take this section set C part off. I don't think we need to reference section C uh, at all. Instead, I think we need to delete it and we can bring it back if anyone disagrees. Um, we have it all in front of us and just say all fire, firearm discharges um, and, and we can start it another kind of way uh, here. But instead, there's no need to reference that, especially if we don't know what we're relating back to. But this subcommittee can uh, correct me too. Um, but are there any thoughts or questions or additions anyone wants to add to recommendation four? Let's begin there. Madam Chair, I think section C comes from this. The citation is 11.10.180 section C, which is found on page 718. Uh, so that's what that, uh, I'm assuming that's what the reference to section C is. I didn't write this uh, one myself. Um, okay. But I've got, uh, I have uh, one, uh, a little bit of a you know, concern because it's got three sections in here, two, three, and four deal with uh, uh, all firearms discharges, some are accidental. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's important to note that negligent discharges are, uh, are, are always fully and completely investigated and almost always lead to discipline or remedial training. Um, so the... Uh, I question whether it needs to go to a force review board, but I'll certainly uh, uh, abide by the will of the committee here just to, so that so that we understand where it's going now. Uh, all firearms discharges as a result of negligence or, or accidental discharges occurring during the application of some kind of force are investigated by the affected employee's chain of command. And, um, you know, the commander then forwards the written report to the chief of police. Uh, discharges uh, uh, only are presented to the force review board when the employee's chain of command determines that it's in the best interest of the department. So, you know, I just put that out there for discussion. If it's a will of committee that uh, this is adopted, I certainly won't stand in the way of consensus. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Fuller. I, I, I appreciate that background. It's helpful uh, information. I'd love to hear from others. Um, 
if we are in support, uh, if we, there's support to include this recommendation, just uh, if we could just succinctly say yes or no, uh, unless you have um, additional support, uh, why do you want to add here? So I do want to be mindful of the time um, as we only have 40 minutes to get through the rest of this. Anyone else who wants to add anything else? Anyone who disagrees um, uh, with including recommendation four? Or would like to add or, or take away from the language here? You know, I'm sorry, I don't exactly understand it. Okay. I, I, I mean, I know there's a reason it's in here. Is it because it's yeah. is it because of abuse? Abuse of it? Is that why? Yeah. Anyone from the subcommittee want to speak to it? This is for our discipline com subcommittee. And I can pull up my original document too. Is uh, is Mr. Cheryl on the call? This may be one of his. I don't believe he is. I can't see my full. I don't have the full list. And the person here has to be treated as if they resulted yeah. in injury to prevent or decrease the likelihood of it happening. So I'm just, to me, I understand it being in there if it in turn causes an injury. But if it has to be reported to the force review board and it does not cause an injury, I'm just questioning, is there another reason that it's in here? I'm sure there is, I just, it, it seems confusing to me. I can't speak to it, uh, an officer on the committee. This was one that uh, I believe Mr. Sherrill put forward. Uh, so you'd have to ask him what the, uh, the purpose is. Uh, my thoughts are, and looking at accidental discharges that I've seen in the past, they're just somebody being negligent. Sometimes it's a, uh, a bullet that's uh, left in the gun while you're cleaning. It goes uh, into the floor. Sometimes it goes into the uh, officer's hand. I've seen that happen. Um, and, uh, you know, it's negligent. It's wrong. It should be investigated. And uh, the ones that occurred, in my understanding, are fully and completely and almost always lead to discipline. So... I just wonder why it's necessary to send them all to the force review board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do see Mr. Cheryl in um, space, sir. Are you, um, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, you know, it's in this Monday, you know, them work days. <laughs> no, I hear you. No, it's okay. Um, yes. I mean, I think all of them should be, uh, we put that forth because I think everything should be investigated. I think that's a way of, uh, uh, the community to instill that trust back in the community. Uh, there's been a lot of issues with uh, the MMPD not being forthcoming with information. And I mean, just look at what's been going on when, when the community knows what's the facts of the case or just, you know, are able to, to feel like it's transparent, then, you know, uh, it just, it provides a more positive uh, atmosphere. And so uh, that's why I, I said that, you know, and, and, and you got to understand we're trying to reestablish trust. The trust is totally lost across the country as it pertains to police and uh, communities. So uh, I just think, you know, um, uh, uh, that'd be a way to, uh, to, for the MMPD to um, be held accountable uh, for everything. And then the, the uh, community to, to believe in and, and, and be understanding about it and, and, uh, that's why we put that for. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bilal, any questions on your end? Well, it looks, it looks like it is investigated. It, from what um, Mr. Pulley is saying, it's investigated. It's just a matter of should it be investigated by the Force Review Board? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the question. You know, we definitely want to increase transparency, of course. Um, but do we want the force review board to be the entity that looks at this? That to me is kind of the part that made me feel like when I read this, well, what is this really saying? What's happening behind this? Meaning, is this being used as an excuse to actually, you know, be using these force and getting away with it. I mean, that's what, when I read that, I, if that isn't the case, I don't want that to be, to appear that way. Because when I read that, I'm like, oh, what's really happening with this? 
And I don't think from what um, Mr. Pulley saying is the case, it really is in most cases negligent and no one's getting hurt except maybe the officer and it is being investigated and we should say it should be investigated. It's just for me, should it be investigated by the force review board when there isn't an injury in the community? I'm in agreement with what Ms. Bilal said. That's fine. That's fine. I can I can live with that one. Okay. What is the actual entity that reviews it? If it's not Force Review Board, Mr. Pulley, who does review it? Thank you. Um, it's reviewed. <clears throat> I'll read you the the sections in the policy. And uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, any firearm discharge as the result of negligent or accident uh, unless occurring during the application of some type of force shall be investigated and reviewed by the affected employee's chain of command. So the involved employee's components commanding employee will review the circumstances and make a conclusion as to whether the weapon discharge was within departmental policy. The component commander will then forward a written report to the chief of police through his or her chain of command detail and his or her conclusion. If the component commander reasonably believes that the employee's actions may have been outside the parameters of the department's policies, procedures, or directives, a recommendation regarding remedial training and or corrective disciplinary action shall be included. And the last section was discharges under the section will only be presented to the force review board when the employee's chain of command determines such review to be in the best interest of the department. That's the way the policy is written. So um, it goes up through the supervisory chain of command. They conduct the investigation and meet out the discipline uh, the way I understand it is now. And from talking with the police department on the realities of how many of these get uh, uh, and you know what, what the result of all these are, uh, it's um, always fully and completely investigated and almost always lead to discipline and remedial training. So um, just to chime in now, do you see how they can be a problem? Um, and that was my point for putting that in. Uh, if, if you're in the community, how, how was that establishing? If I'm your chain of, uh, if I'm your commander and I've been, you've been on the force four, five, six years, we've developed some sort of relationship, okay? Um, how is it, it's almost impossible to not be biased in a situation if we've established a relationship that again there's no there's no way to 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 for that situation to be looked at transparently from a community's perspective so it's all it's all up to the chain of command it's all up to the commander he could say look at it and say hey i know mr pulley he's he's a decent guy i'm pretty sure he didn't mean that that way there's no need for me to move forward with this that's the issue. So that's why I recommended uh, the force review board. Well, that'd be a concern if there weren't, uh, if the discipline weren't really meted out. And I think uh, uh, historically, um, I understand there was a study conducted that shows that our police department really meet out discipline, beats out discipline at a little bit higher level than most do. Um, but let me also, let's see here, I believe, let me, put the composition of the force review board before you. So the force review board's composed of deputy, the deputy chiefs over the uh, uh, officer's unit, the director of training, attorneys from the Department of Law, uh, and the director of the COB, and there may be some others on there, but that's who composes the force review board. But this is Tory Johnson again. I mean, we're not talking about a, a use of a force here, isn't it? I mean, these are the ones. I mean, what I no. always saw it was, was where some officer, uh, you know, dropped the gun or did something, yes. you know, off at the station house or or something like that, where it was a really a an accidental discharge. That's all. Not in the community. About. Not in the. Not as part of an arrest. Not as part of a of a of a an incident with an outside or a third a third party. I thought it was just all. I mean, I thought what we we're talking about 
is where the where the firearm discharges because of, of some officers either accident or, or negligence in and around I mean just at the station house or his car or something like that that's correct so if that's what we're talking about then that's understandable right yeah I think that's what we're talking about not right. not if it involves a third person person or this happened in during a, a pursuit or uh, the arrest or something then that's a whole then i think that the way it stands right now is it goes to the forest review board but this is more where the guy is you know gets his gun and dry slips out of his hand or something and it it shoots a door or something that's right yeah Mr. Sher uh, Cheryl, is that is that um, a sufficient uh, explanation on your part? It is. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to just liken it. Um, go ahead. I cut you off. No, I appreciate the clarification on that. No, I would, thank you. I was just going to liken it in, in just good Nashville uh, terms as a little bit of a, a Barney Fife reference of his, like, one bullet and shooting his own self uh, in this butt kind of thing. <laughs> If that makes sense for folks, um, that might not land for everybody, but uh, I take Mr. Johnson's. That's going to land for some people, not everybody. But um, but it sounds like we're comfortable uh, deleting uh, the recommendation for it. Does that work um, for everyone? And Mr. Sarah, uh, Cheryl, does that principally work for you? Is that okay? Yes, under, under those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move us to data here, recommendation one. You'll notice uh, I did change the title here back to um, um, what it was listed when we did our preliminary recommendations. And this is what um, the, the subcommittee also you were listed under. Recommendation one is about the uh, all put points bulletin uh, that if an officer uses an APB that uh, as a justification for stopping or arresting a suspect that that officer must include the details of the APB um, or the uh, DC, the Department of Emergency Communication, um, in their notes or report. Any comments or uh, comments are here on this recommendation? Recommendation one. Recommendation two. Uh, speak. Speaks to. Yeah. Can, can I ask just a quick question? Is sure. is there any delineation? where an APB comes out over the radio or whether it's um, shared and roll call um, because obviously anything that comes over the air um, will be documented for all records. I guess I didn't understand the, the issue, what, what has created an issue where this, this rule uh, or recommendation should go into effect. Mr. Robinson, just before you unmute, I want to make sure I was clear on your question. Just you were asking what circumstances would um, have warranted the need for this recommendation, right? I, I think, um, let me just open it up to the subcommittee before I answer here. Anyone just want to succinctly answer there? I can. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that the concern here was that very often people are stopped and arrested and or arrested because the, the officer says they meet the um, description of a suspect in an APB. And in some instances in the country, they have gone back and reviewed the APBs and shown that there was absolutely no APB out on a suspect that looked anything like the arrested person. And so it's an accountability measure to make sure that if you use an APB as an, a justification for stopping and or arresting someone, that you can prove that there was an APB out for someone with that description. Thank you, Vice Chair Lucas. Mr. Robinson, does that uh, clear um, answer your question, rather? Okay. I think if if that's the recommendation, uh, do, do, do we suggest how much of a, how much detail? I guess that's one question I have, it, that the officer must include the details of the APB communication in their notes um, I think that just um, included 
any sort of reference information. It doesn't necessarily have to include the entire APB, but if there's a number or anything associated with it or the time that, like you just said, like, did they hear this uh, in the morning in the, at the station? Did they hear it come over the radio? Just something so that it can be linked back to that APB. Would, would, and perhaps instead of saying the details, uh, maybe say must reference the APB? Sure. So, so that- or Identify, include identifying information or something. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Okay. Because that's, that's going to identify the APB, I think, in the information. And if they're, if they're lying about it then, and there was no APB, then it's going to come back on them. So, okay. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sure, Thank no you, problem. Ms. Lucas. Recommendation two speaks to uh, the request that Mayor Cooper and MMPD should meet with community organizations and we've list out a few here to convene a task force to implement the CAHOOTS model of mental health crisis response and request the date of October 2021. Any thoughts or recommendations as to recommendation two of the data? Subcommittee. Recommendation three. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this is Tori Johnson. I, I, uh, the only thing, the only issue I have is, is specifically tying it to a task force to implement the CAHOOTS model. Um, it, it seems to me we've already talked about the fact that there are several different ways of responding. And I don't know that we should be dictating one versus the other, uh, as opposed to just simply saying we, we all recognize that there needs to be anything we can do to improve uh, the way the police department deals and the assets they have to deal with uh, people with mental health issues. I think I think convening the task force, I think all that's great. I just, if this is a recommendation though, but I, I just think we ought to, for my purposes, I think we ought to just say, take a look at anything that's out there uh, uh, as opposed to, because I don't think we've, I mean, I know that some people feel strongly about this particular model, but but I don't know that we we as a group have done the kind of research that 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 says we ought to do one versus the other. Okay. So, Mr. Johnson makes a good, uh, good point here. Uh, if we were to take out the CAHOOTS model and say to implement a um, mental health crisis response, and if we put in parentheses, you know, we either just if we just say a mental health crisis response and offer no example there, then that task force would start to explore on their own and likely would, of course, explore cahoots and others um, and would probably, of course, go back and look at our um, some of our preliminary um, testimony. Um, are we comfortable with that approach? Or can we say the CAHOOTS model or other acceptable mental health crisis response model? All right. Okay. Can I speak to this one, Ashley? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. So the um, Communities Task Force, which is headed up by Judge Blackburn and Sharon Ro Robertson, Roberson, are making a specific, I believe, recommendation about the CIT model. I don't know for those of you who were in our um, presentation from Dr. Valier, he presented information on the continuum of the models. And there's the continuum from the CIT model, which is the crisis intervention team model, or the Memphis model, which is officers being dispatched all the way through um, a co-response model, which is what we heard from Ms. Brock from the mental health co-op about up through the CAHOOTS model, which is um, entirely community-based where police are not present. 
My understanding from the community and community organizations that have addressed this issue, anything from the Nashville People's Budget Coalition to Gideon's Army, who we heard from Ms. Fatuga and Mr. Turnley, through um, community surveys, through the work that we've done with NOAA, is that the community has made it abundantly clear that they would like a non-officer presence response model to mental health. And I think that that is why the recommendation is, is that we implement the CAHOOTS model. Now, if that's something that the committee doesn't feel comfortable um, recommending at this time, I understand you might want to rec convene a task force to implement um, reforms to the MNPD mental health crisis response. Um, but the community has been trying to communicate clearly on this issue. It, it's part of the reason why I think we were assigned to this task or to this policing commission and to this committee is that they would like a voice and their voice has said resoundingly that they want a non-police response to mental health crisis, except in those cases where um, police are required. And CAHOOTS had, last year fielded 24,000 calls and only 1% of those calls required backup from police. Um, I feel like our trip to the academy um, that we heard very clearly from the officers that the transfer dealing with these cases is very difficult. They're not trained for it. Um, transporting patients to, you know, whether or not that's the ER to be medically cleared or to the um, mental health co-op and then having to supervise those patients and not just in Nashville. I mean, I believe the officer at the academy mentioned having to transport someone to Chattanooga even. Um, to, it goes right back to Councilman Pulley's concerns about do we want to pull police uh, into situations that they don't need to be involved with and take them away from their other law enforcement duties. And I would say that this is the exact place uh, where we could really make up some time, and especially since they're short-staffed. And, yes. um, and so I, I really want to advocate for this model to be um, included in the language. If you want to say, and others, I'm not going to object to that. But I just want to let the committee know why it's so important that we really, really advocate for um, a win-win here with the department freeing them up to do their job and also really listening to what the community is saying. Uh, because like Mr. Cheryl was saying, we have got to rebuild trust. <laughs> between the community and the department. And I think that this would be an excellent way to do that is this mental health crisis response that does not involve officers. Thank you, Mr. Just, just jump in here for a second. This is John. Yeah. So I think that there is a clear uh, agreement that we wanna have some kind of co-response model. I do think that uh, it is, it is clearly within the community's committee sort of purview to talk about how to serve specific and vulnerable populations. I know that they have spent a lot of time uh, working with the Behavioral and Wellness Advisory Council and uh, talking with the Mental Health Co-op about this. Um, so I would just say that, you know, in terms of uh, how police interact with vulnerable populations, this seems to me to be clearly a community committee area not so much a policy committee area. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Uh, so everyone, we are running out of time here. I've uh, put together here in front of us um, as something that kind of meets us in the middle here. So we are not landing on what we're saying is, is put down in the middle. There's a committee, as John has uh, enunciated and clearly stated, uh, that will already uh, put very squarely forward what they have recommended. And they put a lot more time in than we have. This simply says it's a, a model similar to CAHOOTS uh, by this date. And I recommend that we move forward with that because what we need to give time to is the use of force, excessive force uh, pace here. Um, is there anything anyone needs to say on this that is uh, just very much focused discussion on recommendation two um, so that before we can move to three and four on this? The only thing I just wanted to add, I wouldn't want to put anything in here that conflicts with the commun with the community um, yeah. component. But I agree with Ms. Lucas that I like the CAHOOTS model. And maybe just by the fact that we mentioned it, it might be something that 
they would consider by at least knowing the name of it and it's a model that we're familiar with that we like. Right. And then an alternative, it, even in the CIT model, you can still use community members. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to adopt any of those three models in a purist right. form. And so what we may want to add just to protect this community component that is so important to us is to say, and regardless of the model that is selected, one that includes community representatives. Right. Thank you, Ms. Bolau. In fact, there's a chair vice chair meeting coming up where we'll come together and discuss these conflicts. So we'll have an opportunity to do just that for those overlaps. But I appreciate those points too. Uh, let's move to recommendation three. I reworded this only to make sure it was a little bit more clear on the screen. So it's a little bit like ABC uh, lined up there. That's the only difference there. And I did line up the language a little bit in the intro. It just states uh, instead of leading with MNCO, it just leads with MMPD because we need to offer direction there. Any uh, thoughts here, um, uh, questions as it relates to recommendation three, uh, saying that MMPD should give access to MMCO so that they can do a review for the request listed there in A, B, and C. Excuse me, A, B, and C. Can, can you, can you, ref, I'm, I'm on my phone and I can't see what's on the screen. Yeah, yeah, I can read it for you. MMPD should support and extend full access to MNCO for the review of A, request for the receipt of weapons and vehicles under the 1033 program, B, request for grant funding from the federal government that will be used to purchase military style weapons and vehicles, and C, proposals to purchase military style weapons and vehicles from vendors. All this is about militarization, uh, equip, military equipment. Ms. Davis, I, 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 I cannot support recommendation three because I, I don't know that we are in the business of of recommending that a department is um, getting equipment, be it military or, or whatever. I, I would hate to handcuff the department in any way that feels like it needs, um, whether it's weapons or vehicles <clears throat> and that they we suggest that they seek review and approval from the mnco before they yeah. they get any purchase it yeah i i just i don't think that's really the purpose of our committee um, well mr robinson can i ask you because i i read this similarly i think my my where the rubber hits the road for me is not the purchasing of it although i think it was a conversation for another day it's really around how are they using it are they bringing military grade you know weapons and vehicles into our neighborhoods and how are they using them are they using it on a september day or something that where it shouldn't be used so i could see mnco reviewing it on an annual or biannual basis and maybe it's not used at all for any reason right and and then that raises other questions um but i think that that's where i would maybe reword the the recommendation uh, how does that strike you and others i guess is my question well we i, I know i'm i'm looking at this more of from a terrorist standpoint mm -hmm. and, and having the 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 vehicles and the weapons to address a terror terroristic um action and i think that the issue of taking it into neighborhoods um i think that's where having a new chief of police is going to uh consider that that those choices um and moving to more of a community-based policing uh, is, is, is going to move the department away from running around in military-type vehicles. 
unless you've got a hostage situation and if I'm the hostage, I don't care if it's a tank or what, if it gets me out, then I'm going to be glad that they've got the equipment that right. they use. So I, I, I can't support recommendation number three. I'll let other people yeah. chime in. Got it. So other word, questions here. We're not talking about recommendation three in its current format. My question here is, is there support for rewording this to um, state that MNCO would be reviewing the use of military, um, the, the military um, weapons and vehicle, MMPDs, use of military weapons and vehicles in other uh, forms, um, military, uh, other supplies on an annual basis. And I just want to clarify for people before they answer that question from Ashley is that it, I, I know uh, Mr. Robinson used the term review and approve. That language is not in there. It says for the review of. So it's just wanting another set of eyes on what is happening in terms of these programs. And mm -hmm. they can offer recommendations themselves. But again, none of this, is, we don't have authority, nor does MNCO have authority, but it is always helpful for the community to have another set of eyes to know what is um, how are resources being allocated? Um, mm -hmm. so I just want people to keep that in mind as they answer Ashley's question. You know, I think I have the same question that I had before, which is why is this in here? Is it in here because there has been misuse of these type of vehicles um, against civilians who are not the drug cartel and are not terrorists and, you know, are these military vehicles that are being used for, you know, Stop yeah. rest or or whatever because when I read this, that's what it makes me think. It makes me think, oh, well, is this in here because they are doing that? And if they're yeah. not, no, doing I think that's that, a great question. If they're not doing that, I'm not sure why this is in here. That's my only. No, that's a great question. But this year is a good good example of how military style. I mean, great um, supplies were used against protesters. Um, and, and great response. I mean, um, we saw on live television. Um, oh, you mean the tear gas? That. You mean in Davidson mm -hmm. County or in the, across the country? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm saying across the country. I'm not just picking on in Davidson County, but I'm, I'm saying we've we've seen it, and and we're responding both nationally and internationally for that matter, and and whether it was weapons or otherwise. So I, you know, I can't speak for this. Space and if we're say, saying comfortably, you know, are we doing this in Davidson County? In Davidson County, are we using this type of vehicles for you know civilian that are non drug cartel, non terrorist? Or, because I'm not sure if it's fair to put that in there if we're not. And I think we mm -hmm. have to be specific to Davidson County because that's mm -hmm. what these recommendations are for. Mm -hmm. Well, in this current, any other comments or thoughts here? So we're not I think they made great points. Um, this would fall under that uh, category of uh, one where I think we need to bet this against the state laws. It relates to uh, what um, uh, we have the authority to, the MNCO does have the authority to do. Um, but uh, I think Mr. Robinson, Ms. Ball made great points as it relates to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Puller. Any other thoughts here on this? I think it's important to remember that we're also trying to prevent things from happening. It's not a question of whether or not MNPD has necessarily, you know, misused military style weapons. I think it is trying to change culture and change um, policies and practices so that things that like what happened in Portland do not happen here in Nashville. And I don't think it's fair to say that a change in leadership, again, going back to what we keep coming back to, is that we need to have these things in policy. And I believe it was Ms. Bilal who said, you know, it, it, it is just not a realistic expectation that we're going to be able to go and evaluate every single thing that is happening against what's in the manual and what's in, you know, practice. So having another set of eyes and just having MNCO review it and flag something that may be problematic seems like a pretty straightforward thing. And so I'm just really confused as to why there would be opposition to this. It didn't say MNPD should discontinue anything. It doesn't say they should stop doing anything. It just says that the militariz militarization of police is a big problem throughout this country. Let's prevent that from happening here 
And what would be a good way to do that? Well, we already have a oversight agency. Um, why don't we ask them to just keep an eye on that and let the community know if they flag any concerns? There may not be any. Um, so I'm not really sure why we wouldn't want to include that. Militarization is a serious issue in policing in this country. Well, I think maybe we just say it that way then. We say that we see militarization as a national issue that has been used as an excessive use of force. And we do not recommend that um, military style weapons or vehicles be used for civilian um, I'm mean, happy to word it, you know, something like this be upfront about what we really don't want them to do. Because when I read this, it makes me think something else is happening that isn't. Um, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure if we can do it either. So let's just say what we're what our fear is that we are seeing this national trend. We don't want it to happen in Davidson County. And we recommend that that type of weaponry not be used, you know, against civilians. I, I would my, my preference would be that we try not to overreach or over legislate and let the department handle this organically based on how the new chief wants to run their community based policing program um, <laughs> That's just, that's my thought. And, you know, if, if you want to um, just put a sentence in there that says, you know, this co committee um, encourages the MNPD to um, review and contemplate the effect of the effect on the community as a whole before obtaining a, a more military style vehicles or employing um, military style vehicles. Yes, hello, right. hello. This is the this is the White Lewis. I just wanted to say I agree with with uh, Miss Lucas uh, with what she said as uh, uh, regarding the proposal. Uh, and Mr. Robinson, one of the things that that I've been thinking is that I thought one of the reasons for this uh, commission was to come up with some recommendations and to have them finished in time that we could possibly show them show them to the finalists for the for the new chief uh and if that person whoever that person is they said well i can't go i can't agree to any of these well you know maybe that person shouldn't come on board not to have that person come on board and then have him or her say i can't agree with any of these uh or i don't like these proposals we want to we want to put some of these out i think before that person comes on board that that was my thought that's my thought Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Austin. Yeah, just, just one moment. Um, and I'm happy to come here. I just want to be cognizant of the time. I know many of you are going to have to fall off uh, here. I just want to acknowledge a couple of things here. <clears throat> and I, as chair, I, for obvious reasons, I've reserved my comments because I, I need to guide us in the meeting. I just take a point of personal privilege here um, and, and just acknowledge a couple of things. One, it's 1.30, so if you need to uh, step aside, please do. But I need to kind of map us out for the rest of the week. Uh, on Wednesday, the chairs and vice chairs uh, will come together for a virtual meeting, and we're going to bring together our um, our problem statements, result statements, and then the recommendations as we currently have them. Ahead of us, we have the use of force, excessive force that we have not gone through, and then the recommendations related to the data committee. I want to just talk about the data committee, the way I'd like for us to approach it. There are nine of them here. Um, many of them are already um, touched on, um, perhaps kind of within the training component of them. Many of them just kind of fall very concretely within the training component of them. I've kind of mapped them out already, and three of them uh, can use very similar language as it relates to the evaluation of costs and effectiveness. Um, and then it kind of has its own language in there. And I'm going to 
uh, word them as such without changing the content of them. Um, what if we agree to adopt all of them and we kind of already preliminarily did that, then I would just pick them up and put them into their respective categories and we will move them as such and vote on them as a holistic document. Um, and that should be relatively quick. The biggest bulk of our time on Thursday, and yes, we will need to meet on Thursday, um, will be going through your support of excessive force and then going through this data committee piece. We will not go back and rehash any other section that we've already uh, spoken about and discussed. After the completion of this section here and the data committee piece, um, we will send to you then the complete document with the, um, the uh, uh, problem statement and the intended result statement uh, with the complete document, and then we will give you the date and time um, of your vote. And the vote needed will just be that you vote aye or nay, um, saying that you agree um, and that you vote um, in agreement with the document so that if we have a majority, then we are in agreement that that will be our submission. Um, I appreciate what folks are saying about our recommendation three. I appreciate Ms. Lewis and Mr. Lewis's uh, statement as well here and Ms. Lucas's as well. I am in agreement too um, that we should not be waiting on this new chief, whoever he or she may be, uh, to guide or lead us. Um, they do not, um, they should not be deciding for us what we want Nashville to look like. Um, we need to decide what Nashville looks like. And the militarization of our police force is something that I will not stand for. And I'm not speaking for the rest of Nashville, but I'm gonna speak for Ashley and those around my in my community to say, we do not want that. And I see what this is standing for here. I see what the subcommittee was going for. Um, I think that we should pick this up. We can pick this up on Thursday and talk a bit more about how do we get to something that we're comfortable with? And let's just take a vote about it. And if the majority of us are saying like, there's just something we can't get behind in its current form, then fine, we'll move forward without it. Um, but let's be clear about what it's saying and let's not conflate what it's not saying um, as what, in order to get past it. Um, so I'm gonna put to bed recommendation three and we'll come back to it. What I do wanna uh, acknowledge is recommendation four to make sure if we're comfortable with that, we can say that we're good on it. Recommendation four just says that community events should be held where residents are given information as to alternative, uh, alternatives for crisis response. Um, is there any conversation about this one? It seems very straightforward, but if we need to talk about that more, we can. Anyone want to talk more about that? Very quickly, Madam Chair, I'm a little confused as to what it means, whether okay. it means that uh, the police department should hold these community events or whether they should offer um, space for these events or, or just clear that up for me. As what the recommendation is? Okay, yes, no, that's a good question. I kind of read into it something different, but let's not read into it. Let's make sure everybody's on the right page, Councilman. So we'll pick it up with recommendation three and make sure everyone's on the same page. I'm gonna, um, if you see green is my color this week, so I'm gonna pick it up with green and know exactly where we'll kick off on uh, that date. Any closing remarks here um, for the good of the cause here before we uh, close out? Because I do want to be thoughtful of people's um, work day and, and just general schedules here. Anything and in terms, of, in terms of scheduling, is our next meeting Thursday at the usual time of 6 p.m.? That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, you, 6 uh, un unfortunately, the vice mayor's moved our council meeting to, uh, oh. to Thursday to accommodate the uh, election. So... Uh, uh, I won't be in attendance, uh, I, and we can talk about that offline. Okay, okay, yes, sir. Well, we've got, I can reach out to you, um, and even if there's something you've got, questions about or you want to submit offline here. Or I'm happy to do that offline. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to take everybody else's time off, but no, yeah, no. I'll send you my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, and we can talk about Thank that. You, Thank you. If anyone else has a conflict se separate, let me know. Um, thanks everyone. Um, you can reach out to me and uh, please do uh, practice your civic uh, duty tomorrow if you haven't already. Thanks so much. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network.
If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.